Open your Bible with me to the book of Luke, at 18th chapter. That's where we'll, I guess we say that's where we'll spring off of. We'll start there and go from there. Uh, Luke, the 18th chapter. The title of my message is The Touch of the Master's Hand. You probably heard this story. I heard it, uh, you know, kind of, I think you put in a kind of a song about the, Kind of the the old violin, you know, the guy was going to they were going to sell it. It was all dusty and everything, wasn't tuned up or anything. So putting it on auction, and then they was asked for two or three or whatever dollars. They wasn't getting anything for it. And there's a man in the back of the audience that was a master at playing, and he got up, came up, dusted the old violin off, tuned it up, and played a tremendous piece on it. And then it went from a thousand, two thousand, three. Who give me four? And it just went on up. It's a difference of the touch. Who had the hand on it that made the difference? And that's a difference in your life and mine. The touch of the Master's hand. You know, the the touch of the Lord Jesus has power over all the enemies of your life. All, you, you're not. We're not in heaven. We want everything to be like it would be in heaven here, but. We're in the world that the Bible, that the Lord Jesus said, it's a, it's, there will be tribulation. There will be trials. There will be tests. There will be problems. And you're going to live through that. And even Job, you know, it says uh, if, a, uh, if a man lives to be four score, you know, it's uh, three score and ten, seventy, or if he even lives to be eighty, he just has more troubles. You know, he's just, because we're not in heaven. Uh, but the wonderful privilege is that we're living uh, with a Savior that has his hand on our life. And, and everything he touches, it just he changes it for the good. And that's what we hope that uh, you will see in this message uh, this morning, that his touch does matter for you and for me. And I just want to read one verse in there, verse 15. He said, and they brought unto him also infants, and he would touch them, but when the disciples saw it, they rebuked him. Well, of course, he went on to, sell, to tell them to, for, to allow little children to come unto him because the kingdom of heaven is made up of, of that kind of a people. It's not talking about little babies so much, but we're, uh, we're totally dependent upon him. And so they understood one thing, that the touch of the Lord's hand was very, very important. You know, we, we find in, uh, that he, he, when he touches, he has power over uh, everything, over the devil, over the disease, over uh, death. You will see that in the scripture. If, if it so be his, desire, uh, his uh, will, he could do he could this touch a body anywhere, anytime, heal it, bring it to life. Uh, but, you know, I believe he wants to fill heaven up too, and there's a lot of people that's gone on before us. I'm sure uh, you're, you have parents that's uh, left you here, and they're there in heaven. At least that would be our desire, that they knew Jesus and that they're with him. But, you know, he touched, uh, his touch is a life-giving touch. I, I imagine if you stop for just a second here in your mind and you look back to a time in your life where you, you knew you were lost, you knew you were a sinful person that needed to, you needed to be saved. And maybe that particular day you're looking at, you put your personal trust and faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior. And what a difference it made in your life from that very moment. You felt the very uh, burdens of, of all those sins upon your life lifted and you were now free. You could just uh, enjoy uh, your life for the first time ever, really, and, uh, and wanted everybody else around you to have that same kind of a, uh, burdens lifted from their life because Jesus actually touched your life. You know, Jairus' uh, daughter had died and uh, these, these are scripture, you may not have time to turn to all of these, but I'll give them to you in Mark, the fifth chapter. And uh, so when Jesus came, the Bible says that he took the damsel by the hand 
and said unto her, Talitha Kumai, which is being interpreted, damsel, I say unto thee, arise. This, a, this was a little daughter that had uh, died, and Jesus touched her in this simple touch of his hand. Sometimes it's good for you and me to touch him, but he, his touch is the most valuable thing in our life. There was a woman, that's, she's just called a, a, a widow woman of Nain, and she had a son that died. It's really hard for you and me to understand things like back in that day uh, where there was an, uh, the, the women were for the most part totally dependent upon, upon the husband or the oldest son to provide the food. Uh, they have no, they didn't work like we do now. We have a lot of women working since uh, World War II. There's a whole lot more women out in the work uh, force there, but uh, making their own way. I talk to them over at the nursing home, girls that are 20, 22, 3, two, maybe three children working to provide for their own little children, you know, because they don't have a, they don't have the man. He jumped out and left and left them with a the whole burden, uh, you know. I could just go over and point out to you four of them in a row, and they're not even over 25 years old. Uh, doing that, but you know, back then, if you didn't have a man to provide for you, you might not have a job to do either. So this woman was now her husband dead. That's why she's called a widow woman. She's a widow, and she's got one son. And, and I don't know how old he was. Evidently, he's old enough to help to provide the means of her home. And she was weeping as they're taking him on the briar to bury him. And the Lord's always touched by the feelings of all of our infirmities. He loves you. He loves me. He proved that when he came out of heaven, marched to Calvary, and died on the cross. That's a proof of his love for you and me. But when he saw this woman, and he saw her weeping, and he walked to the briar, and he touched it, and as the Bible says in Luke 7, 14, he came and touched the briar, and, and they that bare him stood still, and he said, Young man, I say unto thee, arise. She act, he had actually given back to that woman, not just her son, but some also means of support for her life. That's our Lord. That's how he is in every way in, in our life. So, you know, I wonder if you've had that touch on your life. You know, we hope to, as Charlie, uh, I mean, as uh, was said about the song, Victory in Jesus, uh, you know that Brother Joe said, I hoped everyone had that victory. But I hope everyone has had the touch of the Lord Jesus on their life and they know that he, he's uh, given them a life, a true uh, life. I can tell you this, you have eternal life. It doesn't matter you, you, whether you like it or not, you're going to spend eternity somewhere. And the Lord says he's not willing that any should perish but that all come to repentance, everybody would spend eternity with him. He really wants you to be saved. So if there is anyone in here and you have not put your personal trust in Jesus, let me tell you, he told you and he tells me, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. I was uh, in a doctor's office in VA last week and this doctor, uh, she said, I said, well, how are you doing? You know, she's an Indian, and from uh, we just had a conversation. She said, well, if it wasn't for uh, knowing the Lord uh, and having him as my Savior, I wouldn't do so well. I said, you mean you don't think you'd make it that good in Texas? She said, yeah, I, I, don't, I like Texas, she said. But she said, I said, well, I'm a Baptist minister, and she said, oh. <laughs> Like it set her back a little. She said, I like to listen to Joel Osteen, and I almost fell out of my chair because I don't like to listen to him. And you, you can take that and give it to anybody you want, but you listen to him if you want to. But I, I don't like to listen to him because he had a privilege one time to, on national, actually is all over the world, to tell everybody that Jesus is the only way to get to heaven. And when then the guy asked him, is Jesus the only way that you can be saved? This is his words. Who am I to say? I'm to say it because it's right here in the book that God gave us that Jesus said, who cannot lie and promised eternal life, I am the way, not a way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father by, by me. 
but because of the Hindus and the Jewish people that, and thousands of people that do not believe in this Jesus, you tell that and that church empties out in a hurry down there that has 30,000. You claim that and that alone and you'll empty the pews if people don't want to believe it. I'm telling you, 5,000 people Jesus fed and they all went away when he started preaching to them. He gave them a good meal and then when he started telling them that he's the Christ, they went away. And he looked at his disciples and said, will you also go away? I'm telling you, if you stand with Jesus, you're going to find yourself standing somewhat alone. It's easy to come into the confines of this building and be a group with a group of people and sing, oh, how I love Jesus and my victory in Jesus and all that. But when you go out there in that world where you have to live, that's where you'll find that whether you want to really stand up and say, yes, he is. He's my Savior. He's the only way to heaven. And if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't be worth being right here where you are. I'm telling you, folks, Somebody better start standing. We're, fine. We're in trouble today because Christians are not standing up for the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the one that gives us life. He is the one that touched you, and he's the one that wants you to stand up for him. His, his touch is a, a cleansing touch. You know, leprosy is a bad thing. I understand that. Uh, I don't know if we still have them, but I understood that we had two colonies in the United States. And you know, leprosy in the Old Testament if, and during the days of Jesus, if a person had leprosy, they couldn't be around their family. They couldn't even touch their family. They may have children. They couldn't hug their children. They couldn't uh, have anything to do with them. In fact, if you was to start up toward one, they had to wave a white flag to tell you un and unclean, unclean, unclean. Leprosy in the Bible is a symbolic of sin. And so God wants to cleanse us. And so this leper, though, who uh, cannot be around his, if he was married, he can't be around his wife, he can't be around his children, any relatives or any friends, as a matter of fact, except other people that had leprosy. Matthew chapter 8, verses 1, 2, and 3, Jesus was going along, and there were some there were lepers there. It says, when, when he was come down from the mountain, great multitude followed him and behold there came a leper and worshipped him saying Lord if thou wilt thou can make me clean I tell you it makes me want to cry I, I know there's a lot of people that need, that needs that cleansing so that they can enjoy their lives with their, uh, with their families I know people that are alcoholics and druggies uh, they can't enjoy family they can't enjoy they don't want to be around family because of that uh, sin. It's not a disease, folks. It's a sin. To be a drunkard, it's a sin to be a drug addict. And so they can't. They, that pulls them away. This is like leprosy. It, ta it keeps them away from their families. And they need to, the Lord to heal them, to cleanse them, to make them whole where they can enjoy life with their moms, their dads. I know people that won't allow their children even to come to their home because they're, they got on drugs, and they think they tried to help them, and then they got on drugs, and they said, I'm through with it. I don't have anyone. No, who knows what will happen unless they come to the Lord. But this leper came, and he said, Lord, he said, if thou wilt, thou can make me clean. And he can make you clean. I don't care what sin it is in a man or woman's life, a uh, boy or girl's life, the Lord Jesus can cleanse that person. And Jesus put forth his hand and touched him, saying, I will be thou clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. I had a brother like that, alcoholic. I might have told you this, but I, he was my, I think he was the most, I think he was the most handsome man that I'd ever seen in my whole life. But he drug, alcohol ruined his looks, his life, and whenever I would see him, I guess the people think a preacher is something like God. I'm just a man, folks. I'm no better than you are except that I'm calling God to do what I'm doing. My brother would shake my hand like that, stiff arm me. I said, I can hug you. <laughs> he wouldn't do it. But he was saved about five years before he died, and I will never forget the first time I saw him after he was saved, he 
that he ran up and grabbed me and hugged me. It's a total different brother. I'm telling you, there's a lot of things that separates families and people from enjoyment of life because that those things keep them running toward them and getting more into them and they leave Jesus out of their life. But this man was made clean and, and, the, and the Lord did it. It's also a quieting touch. <clears throat> Simon Peter's mother-in-law had fever. Now, if you, this is free. Catholic priest and the Pope cannot be married. And they claim Peter was the first pope. Won't they just follow the line then? If he was the first pope, he had a mother-in-law. Now then, that's free. Here, this woman was sick. Fever is not a comfortable thing to have. I don't know if you've ever had high fever. It'll lay you on your back. It, you don't have any comfort at all. But the Bible says in Matthew 8, 14, 15, and when Jesus was come into Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother laid and sick of a fever, and he touched her hand, the touch of the master's hand, and the fever left her. And she arose and ministered unto him. She served him. What a wonderful Lord. What a wonderful Savior that we have. It's a, a touch of, that gives us life. It's a touch that it uh, cleanses us, <coughs> excuse me, and it's a quieting touch. Have you ever had that touch? Well, I remember July 13, 1969. I never have looked back from that day and wanted anything other than what God gave me and to go forward and learn more about him. You know, I, I think that it's a, if you really want to enjoy your Christian life, if you're saved, you just learn all you can about Jesus. You're going to find that you really have it good and that he loves you and cares for you continuously. And number four, it's illuminating touch. Jesus healed two blind, blind men that followed him. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 27 it said, when Jesus departed thence, two blind men followed him, crying and saying, Thou son of David, have mercy on us. And when he was coming to the house, the blind men came to him. And Jesus said unto them, Believe, believe ye that I am able to do this? And they said unto him, Yea, Lord. Then touched he their eyes. You know, we're blind at a lot of things. And God touches our eyes and opens us. I don't. I don't know. Uh, my wife and I married in 1960, and I, you know, I thought I knew everything. I think I was a fairly decent person, but I didn't know a whole lot about being a married man. Or, and a couple of years later, started bringing family, children. Certainly didn't know nothing about being a, a good father. You're learning all these things, but then. When the Lord saved me, he didn't just save me from going to hell. He saved me and gave my wife a husband and my children a father that I thought they already had. Folks, what I'm telling you, when he takes hold of your life and touches you, he makes a world of difference in the way you see everything else. I remember sitting in the living room of our house, pastoring in Gatesville, had all my children all, all four of them, my wife, was just sitting down the floor in a circle. And I went through the things that I know I made the mistakes on and apologized to my kids and told them that I would love them and her. <laughs> my wife and I would be there for them no matter what, by God's grace. I never went into my marriage looking for a way out. But I knew after Jesus, I didn't want out. My kids, my wife, and myself, together with the Lord. As far as what Joshua said, as far as me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And by God's grace, I will die serving the Lord. Their eyes were open, and Jesus straightly charged them, saying, See that no man know it. I don't know all about that statement, but I accept people would just come for 
the healing and maybe not like the guys and all that got fed just went away and just have have a healing time and and gone. I don't know why, but he, he just said, don't tell anybody. You know what? <laughs> they didn't have to tell anyone. People could see that they weren't the same. They could see everything. You know? Is that the way it is in your life? And people look at you and know you're a Christian by the way you act? They know you're different? Or do they not see any different than the other lost person in the world out there? See, they can look at you and tell by your actions that there's something different about you. His touch is a reassuring touch. The disciples <clears throat> felt this touch on the Mount of Transfiguration. I don't know all that would bring them down to be have such fear as they did, but they did. You know, we, we think, well, goodness, you know, if I was there, and I saw the Lord Jesus transfigurated, and, and I'd be happy. I don't know. I, I don't know what my old flesh would respond to if I, all this happened all of a sudden. It, it got to them because the Bible says that, that they were afraid. And, and uh, Matthew 17, 6 and 7 says, When the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were sore afraid. That means they were shaken. They were just almost beside themselves with fear. And in verse seven, 7, he said, And Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and be not afraid. I don't know the circumstances of your life, but I know you know them. And I know like uh, Charlie said, when we go through different things, when he's having surgeries, only by the touch of the master's hand can bring the peace so that he can get just relax and go on through with things. I'm in the hands of the Lord. I was in Gatesville, Pastor, and I got a letter from the hospital saying that they wanted all pastors, if they could, to, if they knew someone's having surgery, please come and pray for them before they go because they not only do they go through surgery better, easier, but they also heal faster. Well, I believe that. You're more relaxed in, when you know you're reminded that you're in the hands of the Almighty God in heaven and he's okay, it's going to be all right, you know, and so they do. But it is a healing touch. The, <clears throat> excuse me, the touch of Jesus replaced the ear of a servant. You know, when <laughs> Peter was always saying, I can or I will, and he's that boisterous, you know, he was... He had to be humbled. You know, he, he, he told the Lord, I'll not deny you. But he did. You know, when the Lord's going through the trial, he denied him three times. And, uh, and when, he's always doing that, because that was just his nature. Uh, he, he said that he'd never, he'd always love the Lord and never leave him. Well, when the Lord uh, questioned him, he learned a lesson. He said, Peter, you love me. Well, the Lord used a different word. He, uh, he used the word agape, which is a, a, a love without end. I mean, just, I, you bet. Now, Peter said, Lord, you know I love you. He said, he used a different word. He used the word phileo, which is brotherly love. He asked him again, you, you love me? She used the same agape. Peter would not use that word. He said, you know, I phileo ye. And then the Lord said, you phileo me? He said, yea, Lord. He said, feed my sheep. You learn a lesson. Humanly, you can stand up and say, I never will deny the Lord. And the next thing out of the breath of your mouth, you're denying the Lord. You know, that's the old human nature, but he will not ever deny you as his child. He touched you, he touched you with a healing touch. But it says in Luke 22 about this man, verse 50 and 51, and one of them smote the servant, that one was Peter, of the high priest and cut off the, the ear, he cut it off. 
He didn't just skin it or leave us gas. So he cut it off. And Jesus answered and said, Suffer ye this thus far. And he touched his ear and healed it. What I'm trying to get across to you this morning, I do not know what you're going through or what you have been through or what you shall go through, but the Lord is there for you. And he's there to touch you and to lift you, to cleanse you, to heal your feelings, your hurts, your pains, whatever, whatever it is. He can give you the grace that you need to go on with life. And the last thing is his touch is a saving touch kept Simon Peter from sinking. You remember the scripture where it tells us that the Lord Jesus was come across Galilee walking on the water and then when Peter saw it was him, they were getting afraid but then when they saw it was the Lord he said, let me do that. Okay, go ahead. I'll let you. And so it says in Matthew 14, 29 and he said, come, and when Peter was come down out of the ship, who walked on the water to go to Jesus. But something happened, didn't it? And immediately Jesus, it says, I, I skipped verse 30, but it's kind of a bolster, a slight storm was coming up, and Peter got afraid and started looking around at everything around him, went down, started going down. But it says, and immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? Peter uttered three words, three little words in his prayer when he was sinking. Lord, save me. <laughs> okay. What am I saying? I'm saying you may be walking along doing real good in life, and you get to looking around you and everything is just falling apart in your life. Everything's just going to pot. And you start sinking. And you say, Lord, help me. And he does. With his healing hand, with his touch, he loves you. He cares for you. You will never get away from him where he doesn't love you as one of his children. Do you know him? Have you trusted him? Have you put your faith and trust in him as your personal savior? That's the beginning point of all the other things that he can do. Taking care of every single need. I do not know what this world has to, we have to face in this world, but I do know the master's hand is on our life and he'll take care of us. As we all stand and song leader, and pianist comes and I invite you this morning to come, to trust Jesus, to, to know that beyond a shadow of a doubt that he died on that old rugged cross as though you were the only person in the world, he would have died just for you. And he did. And he paid your hell for you. And you can trust him, and then you'll be in the hands of the master. What page? 240, 240. The very first verse. The invitation will not be real long unless we just have people coming. It's your invitation, though, to do what God's calling on you now to do. Will you come while we sing? Mm -hmm.